Hey friends, I've got an opportunity in a podcast for some of you Apple enthusiasts with a funny bone out there, the Cult Cast Podcast. It's the official podcast of Cult of Mac. If you're looking for a tech podcast that doubles as a comedy cast, this show is for you. It's a 30 minute show that gives you the biggest news headlines in the Apple and tech sphere for that week. It's literally a one stop shop for Apple news, reviews, and how to's. The team is an international squad of Apple experts, they blog around the clock. They've also written for Wired, Scientific American, The Guardian, and Fast Company. They'll sift through all the rumors, the tweets, and the news coverage of the week and bring you what's most important, and they'll have a ton of laughs while doing it. Join the community and stay up to date on everything Apple in just 30 minutes a week. and Have some fun doing it. Find CultCast wherever you listen to podcasts or at cultofmac.com. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm chatting with Ben Caymans. He's the founder and CEO of Spring Science. They are making AI tools built just for scientists. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. How about you? I'm getting there. We're getting ready for an ice storm this side, so it's going to be crazy to see uh, how that works out. I uh, I will get to use my backup generator for the first time, hopefully, when the power goes out, but uh, we'll see. I'll be hopefully be on the other side, and hopefully the power won't go out while we're on this podcast. Uh, it's tough down here in Southern California. I think we're heading like, you know, 65, 64. Yeah, boo freaking who. <laughs> <laughs> so you and I know each other from the diabetes space. We are both type 1 diabetics, and I think I'm looper number seven. I think you're looper number five or six. We were look, looking at those artificial pancreas systems very, very early on. I appreciated very much when you and I were on a, a FaceTime almost seven or eight years ago building Uh, Nate Radcliffe's loop application on our local machines and trying to get our insulin pumps hacked. And now we are together looping. uh, Looping, for those who are not familiar, is running a closed loop artificial pancreas, basically Tesla autopilot for diabetes, except it doesn't usually swerve entirely off the street and hurt somebody. So we were really early on that kind of stuff. Have you always been into healthcare as a tech for healthcare? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, I, I owe you a ton of thanks because before Loop, you helped me get acquainted with and sent me some some tools to try, play around with Open APS, the, you know, the precursor systems before Loop. And I think you are in a, in a weird way. You know, we only talk every however often we we get on chat, but you're in a weird way responsible for a lot of my biggest advances in diabetes care and the technology that I use as a result of it. So I appreciate both. Of your writing and um, you personally helping me. You wrote that great blog post about the metaphor of dealing with type 1 diabetes as flying a plane where you don't have access to the altimeter and you know the controls as you pull down. It's a 30-minute delay as the plane slowly ascends and vice versa. And it's a great blog post. And uh, I've used that many times when somebody close in my life wants to try to better understand what type 1 diabetes is. So I'm appreciative of your writing. Uh, to answer the question, I have always been very passionate about health, partially from my experience with type 1 diabetes. My dad was an ER doctor. I was always like in that culture. I went and visited patients with him a lot. But professionally, I tried to keep those worlds very separate for a long time. You know, I wanted to be healthy with diabetes and then not have it have any impact on my personal and professional life. I didn't want people to know about it. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't I wanted to be successful and healthy and have them have nothing to do with each other. And, you know, diabetes would have no effect on me type thing. And what spring science really kind of represents is as I grew older, I, I wanted to unite those things. I wanted to unite my professional life with the empathy that one builds for all sorts of health conditions when you're constantly dealing with one. And that's why I decided to professionally step into the field, whereas previously I kind of didn't want anything to do with it. It was almost like the personal stuff was enough. I didn't want to be near it in my professional life or or elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. For for just for the folks that are listening uh, to really establish your bona fides, I'm a huge fan of you, not just as a person, but as an engineer. You were a VP of engineering at Fog Creek Software with Joel Spolsky, and you ended up being engineer number one at Sal Khan's Khan Academy. So you worked at Khan Academy for six years. You volunteered first. And in early 20, uh, early 2012, uh, 2010, rather, 
And then when Khan Academy became a real company, you were the first engineer. So Khan Academy, that's a pretty like, impactful thing. Uh, and so kudos to you for, for making that happen. And you've been doing spring science now for as a startup for now six years. Is it graduated? Is this like a real, it's not a startup anymore, is it? When do you decide when you have real estate? Like when does a company become not a startup? We, you know, by definition of aiming for high growth uh, and, and lots of change quickly, we are a startup, but yeah, we've been around for six, seven years now. We don't think of ourselves as a, you know, a tiny seed stage startup. We're in an industry that requires yes, speed and change, but also maturity, a lot of evidence validation, working with big partners that tend to move somewhat, you know, steadily in their pace. So uh, are we graduated in some ways? Yes. In some ways, no, we're still in the fight. And yeah, I mean, Khan Academy, I was very grateful to be a part of that. Much of that was just taking a lot of the lessons from Fog Creek and Joel's leader, Joel Spolsky's leadership in particular. I don't know if listeners of this podcast know, I, you know, Joel Spolsky feels like the name used to ring out and everybody knew Joel on software. And now all these young kids don't know, don't know Joel and Joel on software, but a, a lot of his teachings about management and software development. I was very grateful to learn from and then bring that to Khan Academy and, and, and help build the engineering side of that organization, which was awesome. Yeah. For, for our, for your and my generation, I think that Joel Spolsky and then also like Steve McConnell are like names that really were significant, really meaningful. And I, I wonder with so much learning happening online, people don't necessarily read uh, like Steve McConnell's book, Code Complete, or are, are familiar with Joel on software, which was kind of like the blog when I started blogging, gosh, 25 years ago. It was a whole cultural thing, leadership in the blog space. You definitely weren't a programmer and didn't know about Joel on software. Yeah, it was a foundation. And of course, became Stack Overflow. Speaking about spring science, from a what's happening in science perspective is the complexity of experiments is, is greater than ever. And the data that a any experiment, when a, when, a, when a scientist gets together with a group of people, they get funding and they decide to go and do an experiment, they are not just creating megabytes of data anymore. They are creating terabytes of data. They're not just putting together an Excel spreadsheet and then doing some graphs and saying, I think there's a pattern there. Was it the data size and the complexity of the experiments that made you feel that spring science was needed to make those tools to help? Yeah. So it's partially that, and, and you've nailed that reality that we are creating massive biological data sets all the time these days. The biotech industry has done an incredible job innovating on devices, whether they are ways to read DNA, ways to consume proteomics that are going on in our body, imaging devices. We appreciate that our bodies and biology is very complex. And so the industry has had this hypothesis that's grown over time, which makes intuitive sense, which is if you can capture more of that complexity, if you can read more of it, if you can understand more of what's happening, then we would have a better shot at understanding a disease or treating a disease or you know helping us with suffering caused by our biology in some way and the technology to create that data and read things whether we're talking about the genomic revolution everybody's seen the charts of the price falling of uh, sequencing genomes or other modalities reading other molecular dynamics that are going on within our cells and our bodies or imaging stuff that technology has just exploded and now we're in this kind of conundrum where you have an incredibly powerful ability to generate huge complex data sets that represent something about what's going on in our bodies and our tissues and ourselves. And we struggle to deal with it and to get actionable information about it. We struggle so much that you can find a lot of people in the industry who are, who are sort of dismissive of it. They're insulting of it. They'll, they'll um, say, you know, this data is kind of a waste. Why are you generating all this data? You don't know what's going on. You don't understand what's happening. We need to understand the disease. And you know what? There's some real truth in that skepticism. While I disagree with its forward-looking diagnosis is justified in a lot of its criticism of our current inability to deal with that data. So if you go look at what's happening in these companies right now, companies that are trying to develop new therapeutics or trying to develop new diagnostics, you have these brilliant scientists who are trying to better understand a disease so that they can develop a therapy for it or better understand how a therapy works that they're testing. And they have access to generating these very complex data sets about their drug or about their disease. And then they're stuck. And 
you joked that they're not, you know, just pulling up a spreadsheet, but actually, you know, their skill set uh, in many cases has been a very scientific and elite scientific skill set. And so, what do you do? You know, in, in some cases, you're just you, they are pulling up a spreadsheet. And so, you know, we work in the imaging analysis space. In some cases, people are literally drawing on a screen and measuring parts of a cell, things like that, or they have partnerships with very advanced computational folks who are coming into this industry. And that's wonderful. That's that's happening at an increasing pace. And those computational folks are generating a whole bunch of analyses about their data, but there's this wall between them. They're, they're, they're throwing questions at the, at the analysis folks and the analysis folks go chug away for a couple months and they throw some answers back. And the size and complexity of the data is exacerbating this difference between these therapeutics and scientific and biology experts and the folks who are capable of dealing with and analyzing this data. And while I'm optimistic about over time that sort of mending on its own because it needs to, we're trying to accelerate that by building the tools that the scientists deserve that give the power of this analysis that typically only a data scientist or somebody who's equipped with the latest states of AI could give and, and to unite these teams together with tools and technology that is more at the bleeding edge that you would see and would be more familiar to folks in other industries, but it takes a lot of time to bring these tools into these industries. There's a lot of specific biological nuance. There's a lot of validation you have to do. There's a lot of cultural mending between the language and approaches of biology and the language and approaches of computation that needs to be built. And so we aim to build that software and those tools that mend that gap and basically give scientists superpowers, give them the powers of the AI technology so that they can not only analyze those data sets, but bring their human scientific and biology expertise to bear because just the computation on its own doesn't do it. And just the biology on its own is floundering against that data size and you need to bring them together. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, I'm imagining uh, someone using like an on-screen ruler, looking at a picture of a, of a cell or looking at a picture of something going on under slides there. And I'm not in any way a doctor. I'm, you know, healthcare adjacent, but I'm imagining all the things that they're not considering about the DPI of the monitor. Like you're measuring pixels and you're inferring nanometers or whatever the size, I don't know what the size of cells is in the meter sense, but they're making all kinds of assumptions and the technology is standing in their way and there's no tool set to understand that. But it's not the doctor's job or the scientist's job to, to bridge that gap. So then if we, Fast forward to one of the examples of a product from Spring being able to quantify cell types. You're using AI to look at these images, and then are they effectively building a model themselves without knowing that they're necessarily building a model? They think about it in terms of classification, and you're taking care of building the, the model to do that classification for them based on their expertise. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So yeah, I mean, measure it. when we started the company in 2016, 2017, it was not an unheard thing of that people would actually go drag a ruler across cells to try to measure their diameter as one of the features are measured. Now that's going away rapidly with other basic tools, but dealing with DPI settings in the monitor, that's the least of the problem. The, the bigger <laughs> problem is there's so much data in those images. There's so much meaning in biology when you take a microscopic picture of a cell and we've been sitting there scratching the surface at what a human can interpret. Okay, I, I can conceive of the concept of diameter, so I guess I'll measure diameter, and maybe that will be interesting to us. But with, with the genomic revolution, what happened is that the data was inaccessible, and we had to build this technology that let us sequence genomes cheaply and get that data out. And so there was this explosion of data as the technology got better. But with microscopes and images, it's this inverse situation where the data has been there. We've been able to take pictures of cells and tissues for a long time, but there is an enormous amount of biological information in there that is not human interpretable. We didn't evolve to look at those cells and determine the nuance of what's going on with mitochondria, what's going on with this cell, as the cells get closer together. And so I'll answer your other question, but really the, the real meaning here is that there's a deep biological signal that humans could not otherwise pull out, that now AI tools can pull out, and that's what we want to start to expose to scientists. Does that make sense before I talk about the modeling question you asked? No, it does. I want to do a little bit more uh, philosophical discussion, though, about like wavelength of light before we get into this, because sure. I think that there's a direct line between when you take a, a photograph 
you know, quote unquote, a photograph or an image of cells, and you take an image of stars in space. And we're seeing the exact same thing happen where we're looking at images, we're reinterpreting images, we're reinterpreting imagery, and then applying false colors, applying multiple filters to wavelengths. And it's so kind of crazy to me that there are stars that are millions of light years away, and we're taking pictures of them. And then there's like the quantum realm, to use an Ant-Man reference that we're taking pictures of. And both of them have huge amounts of data, but we are looking at it through such a narrow wavelength. And, and then we try to apply false color, but all we're doing is just peeping through the tiniest pinhole, uh, you know, to use a, a, a looking at the sun through a pinhole camera kind of analogy there. It seems like you're saying that we're looking at these cells through a pinhole that is really human biology, and we need to break free of that. Totally. I mean, agreed. And it's not only that we're limited in terms of the pinhole that we get information through or we get the light passing through, but also, you know, if we're looking at a bunch of stars, you get that light coming through. It takes quite a nuanced computational and expert astronomical approach to figure out what the hell do these wavelengths mean? It, it was not human interpretation. You know, if you're building computer vision for self driving cars, hard problem. I'm not minimizing it, but at least when you look at the test set, the human is like a stop sign. It should probably recognize that as a stop sign or a person. It should recognize that. If you're ingesting these subtle wavelengths of stars, or if you're looking at images of cells, it's a very difficult problem because humans did not evolve. We do not know exactly what the meaning is or what the signal is that's in there. But I guarantee you in that light that's coming from those stars, and certainly in the images of cells, there's deep, deep meaning in there. And that has not been accessible to us. And it's gradually becoming more accessible with these tools. How are we confident that AI can tell these things? Because it's all about interpretation and we're trying to teach it. We, we know it can know things. We know that there's things we want to know, but we're kind of poking at a black box. And with AI, we're training models. We then have to validate the model that, that it is correct, share the model with other people, tune the model. And to be clear, for the folks that are listening, we're not talking about very large language models. We're not talking about generative AI yet. We haven't talked about any of the new stuff because you were doing machine learning, which is now AI, years before people got excited about AI, right? These are very highly tuned models, particularly in the vision space, which is a totally different thing that kind of is happening uh, with the chat bots right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, our approach in this space is to start from a place of humility about what AI and computers can understand and cannot. And that's why, I mean, you heard me ramble on, it's a true belief of ours that you have to unite the powers of these computational models and tools with human-driven experimentation and expertise. And so, for example, the way that works, for example, to get to one of your prior questions about how we do modeling, humanity is nowhere close to the point right now of being able to take a picture of a bunch of cells and then just magically tell you Here's all the things that are going on with diseases. Here's what's going to develop. Here are the therapies that are going to help. Here's all the you know higher level biological construct constructs that are happening. We're not there. I actually think we're going to get there. I'm very optimistic of it, but we're not there right now. A computer does not know that type of stuff. So what a computer does really well, though, is it it can pattern match. And so you mentioned scientists being able to train their own AI models. Right now, somebody can run an experiment with our platform. They generate a whole bunch of microscopy images and you know, imagine you're looking at a bunch of different images of different immune cells. And the scientists might be interested. They say, hey, these immune cells look like they're undergoing this type of death. These immune cells look interesting to me for this other reason. And they just start clicking and labeling them. And then our system will use modern AI approaches, but customized for cell microscopy and scientist workflows to automatically classify across their many terabytes of data. Okay, how many cells are going down this specific pathway or phenotype, how many are going down this one according to your labels, and therefore, which of these drugs that you applied are causing an increase in this type of cell death that you want or don't want or causing a decrease in this. And then we can do that across many, many different phenotypes because as more scientists are training these different models, you start accumulating this human-driven biological expertise that is scaled and modeled and applied by the AI. And so that's kind of workflow one that tries to resolve that conundrum that the computers don't magically know everything about biology. And that workflow basically started with a human has a bias or a piece of expertise, and they want to apply it at scale really easily. 
The second type of workflow that's really valuable with these sort of models is the computer can suggest possible hypotheses. So what our system will do is you'll ingest a big experiment. Maybe a pharma company says, I have a whole bunch of patients who I gave an immunotherapy to, and only half the people responded. Half of them responded, half of them didn't respond. What was different about the patients, about the responders and the non-responders? Because if I could understand that, maybe I could design a better drug so that more people respond to the immunotherapy. And so then you ingest all these images of the responders and the non-responders. And then the system can look at what the cells physically look like. So literally like cluster all the different types of phenotypes that the cells look like in the responders and in the non-responders and start surfacing for you. Here's examples of images and these cells that look sort of like this, they show up a lot more in the non-responders than the responders. And that doesn't immediately tell you, okay, well, you know, it's some mitochondrial driven deficiency, but a cell biologist can look at those example images and start to develop hypotheses about what's going on there. And they never would have spotted that among, you know, the many terabytes of data and all the nuances in those, in the biologies of those cells. And so just by showing humans these classes of phenotypes of cells that are different from A to B, they can develop a hypothesis and they can go validate it, design an experiment and work their way to understanding it. So that was a an AI hypothesis put in front of the eyes of a human that worked its way towards biological understanding. Uh, in, the, in the literature for spring science, you call out human expertise coupled with unbiased AI. And you specifically mention the idea of unbiased AI a lot. It seems like you feel, you feel very strongly that AI needs to provide like a tool, but not an opinion. The opinion comes from the, from the human. Like you really don't want to downplay human expertise in any of these tools. And I've talked about this on other, with other guests. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about bias in, in AI. How do you ensure that you are not leading them in the wrong direction and the AI doesn't have bias creep in, especially with large groups of people? Because we're not looking at pictures of people, we're looking at pictures of cells. But those people have characteristics, they have ages, they have backgrounds that are all different. Yeah. So definitely right on the money that I don't think in this industry, it makes any sense to try to advance therapeutics or diagnostics without having human expertise strongly in the workflow of developing that technology um, and, and enabling that human expertise is what we want to do. Also, I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of times in biology, if you go to a biotech conference or if you're reading websites like ours and they say unbiased analysis, typically what they're referring to with that unbiased is they're saying, there's a whole bunch of data and we're going to surface things for you without starting with a hypothesis. Mm. And the hypothesis would be the bias. And it, it is flipping on its head this scientific approach of, I'm going to start specifically with a hypothesis, which is my bias. And that sounds negative, right. but in assume this case, nothing. It's, it's, you're basically saying we assume nothing. We have no, we're not building towards any bias. So there's the term bias in the sense of being biased for or against a, a type of person or a scientific bias, which you're saying is a hypothesis. We're assuming no hypothesis. And exactly. See where the data takes us. And, and that is a useful approach to be married with cases where you have a bias. And you can marry those things the same way I, I said, in an unbiased manner, look at all the different features of these cells and all the cells and show me which ones are clustering in this way. And that's an unbiased scientific method. And typically in biotech, when somebody says unbiased about a technology like this, that's what they're referring to. That does not, however, minimize your question is also very critical because people are also worried about experimental bias or batching bias or other things that cause a red herring to show up, especially when you're do if you're doing this unbiased analysis, you're susceptible to red herrings. It's the double-edged sword. You might pull out something really interesting biologically, and you might pull out something completely absurd. As an example of the power of these models or types of biases, you have to be careful about in this. We once ran an experiment before we had our own lab to generate this data. We had worked with partner labs to generate it. And we once worked with partner lab A that took a bunch of mice and they, they sacrificed the mice. They harvest a bunch of cells from those mice. They send those cells to another lab. And that lab takes microscopic images of all those cells. And then they send those images to us. And we were validating our technology and building technology on those images. Well, we have the whole chain of how those experiments ran, when the batches ran, which microscope they run on, which human sacrificed the mice in lab A. 
you could train a model on the images and accurately predict which human killed the mouse. And that is a interesting and concerning effect in this system because it means that they might have been doing something different or maybe that human only selected mice from this side of the lab and this human was doing it in another side of the lab and they had been fed differently. Who knows what the reason is? There's so many possible things there. But if you aren't aware of that sort of setup, you can imagine how when you were in a clinical trial, you could get into racial differences, age differences, where the samples were collected, when they were collected, how they were collected. If you're not aware of the possible biases going into that and possibly countering it, looking for meaningful information that can explain things biologically that counter that, you are susceptible to tons of bias in this industry and it is a very difficult problem to solve. So that is all very true. It's a legitimate concern. And there's other deeper problems in the industry when you get into more representative patient representation in biological samples. Like if you go start trying to get samples from biobanks or run clinical trials, you'll quickly find how hard it is to get coverage across races, ages, disease groups, and the like. And we're biologically different in meaningful ways, and that causes biases as well. And so that those are all major challenges in the industry. And they all contribute to what we have to acknowledge is we're just not good as an industry at developing drugs yet. It is expensive. It is error prone. And a lot of these things are at the root of some of that. Yeah. First, I want to thank you for that and for helping me tease apart my overloading of the word bias with my own understanding as well as applying that scientific understanding of the word bias because I was not understanding that bias was used in multiple ways as the same word. So I want to thank you for that and I hope that that helps our audience as well. And then it is interesting that you're right. We we are kind of taking a shotgun approach doesn't you know from historically from a drug creation perspective because if the second part of the advertisement on television is all of the side effects for the drug then you know what I mean like you know may cause and then it's like here's in the next 90 seconds of all the things that happen i was actually seeing a drug advertisement on a tv show a couple of days ago and i didn't realize till the end that the drug was itself to prevent side effects from another drug so that the advertisement was hey if you're taking this thing and it makes you feel like crap we'll give you this other drug that is from another totally different company whose only job is to tamp down the side effects from the other drug. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't they just make the side effects go away? So <laughs> it makes you wonder how we have got all these drugs and we're pushing all these chemicals into our bodies. We'd like them to really do the least. We want it to be very surgical to overload that word surgical. It's eye-opening. I mean, I am a long-term optimist in this industry and in general. I think over time, we take more control of our biology and we suffer less due to our lack of control of our biology. You know, and getting back to type 1 diabetes, I mean, I'm, I'm part robot. I've got this stuff on me. I'm, I think over time, this stuff keeps getting better and I'm grateful for that. I'm so great. You know, I'm literally alive because of this industry. And so I'm so grateful for that. And at the same time, I mean, we're just objectively terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I mean, and I could cite all the boring stats about the amount of money it costs to develop a drug and the rate of failures and how 90% of them fail. I, I think some of the more interesting visceral stuff is like, imagine you're interviewing and hiring people for a team in this industry and you come from the tech world and you're interviewing brilliant people objectively by their career, their, their seniority and their successful people who've been in the industry for 20, 25, 30 years, many people like that have never been a part of a program in which a drug has ever advanced into patients but out, out of clinical trial, like actually through FDA approval. It's actually somewhat rare. It's like a, a special badge that someone wears if they've ever been a part of a drug program that successfully made it through the clinic and is one of those drugs that's being advertised on TV with all of the with all the side effects. It's like a, a spe now imagine if you're in the tech industry for 25, 30 years, you've never shipped a product beyond beta. But you're still considered successful. It, right. It's a very confusing thing. And I don't say that to be insulting to those people because they're brilliant and hardworking and we wouldn't have the drugs we have if we, if we didn't have those people pushing and trying and failing. It's just a statement of the reality of how little we understand about our biology and how little we control it right now. And I say that still with all the optimism that I share that I think we'll take control of it. I think we're on a path to doing so. I think we're taking steps and we're getting there, but it's an industry full of massive, expensive failures all the time. 
And it's uh, one of the most important things for us to get better at. And it seems like spring science is trying to apply the technology that we have now, the technology that we're going to have tomorrow to reduce the side effects, to reduce the waste, to reduce the confusion, and really draw, draw a straight line between this drug affects that cell in that way and have a real understanding of the cause and effect. Because it seems right now we're just kind of like poking the body with a stick and we're lucky that any of these drugs work at all. That's exactly right. So imagine you have this deluge of data, you don't exactly know what to do with it, and you're trying to develop a drug. Well, you're, you're stuck because you don't have the tools to deal with that data. And so you have to develop an experimental plan in which you just choose a couple things to poke at. You know, you have a hypothesis. I think that this drug should have this effect on immune cells. I'm going to measure that effect. If it does, great. I'm going to check if it's super toxic. If it's not, I'm going to advance this into a phase one trial, and I hope that it doesn't hurt anybody. Then I'm going to advance into phase two, and I hope that it starts to see an effect. Then I'm going to advance into phase three, and I hope it's bigger. And there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of like, <laughs> I don't know. I hope I hope it's going to work. I, you know, I've got a theory, and I don't mean to be again minimizing. Like I have deep respect. It's a hard situation that we're in. Now, imagine if we developed tools where before you took that first leap, you could see a lot of different effects that, that you could understand a lot of different effects that, that drug is having. Like what, like people work with us right now and they say, okay, I've got these three or four drugs and I'm considering putting one of them. In, I need to choose one, just one to put in the first clinical trial because it's expensive as shit and also as heck. And when it fails, that program's probably going to get killed. So I need to pick and these four drugs I have all seem really similar, but they have these little effects. They we can tell there's like a little bit of a difference. I don't know what's the difference. And so they put those drugs on cells, they use our system, and all of a sudden they can start to see all of these nuanced, interesting differences that are happening. And they have a chance to try to tease out some information about those differences so that they can better choose that drug, maybe minimize side effects, maybe have a better shot at patient response, that sort of thing. And I'm not sitting here pretending that anybody could say, we 100% solve that. You know, there you will find entrepreneurs in the biotech space who are like, we solve this. You know, we tell you everything. Nobody is there yet. Anybody who solves that is immediately the richest person alive because if we could design a drug and predict that it will work or not or what side effects it would have, you know, we're building Dyson spheres. It's like the, our, our, our civilization is taking off. Um, but we're not there yet. Springs technology is taking steps towards it. And I think we and other companies keep progressing. I think one of the biggest challenges and one of the things Spring is doing that's very different than others is most of the economic forces in this industry will push you towards trying to develop your own drug company and owning the drugs yourself. And so in the tech industry, you're used to a world where when you start a company or you start a new venture, you have all these horizontal tools you plug together. You know, you get Stripe to do this and this hosts your website and this does this and this does this and you plug them all together. In biotech, it's actually somewhat rare to have these horizontal software companies like Spring, where we're focused on giving access to the tool to as many people as possible. And we specialize in our thing and give a great tool to you for these things for you to develop drugs. That's actually a hard or a new economic challenge in the space. And I think it's one of the things holding the industry back. You have all this balkanization of everybody trying to do all of it themselves, but the tech industry has built these layers of acceleration on top. And biotech needs more of that. They need more of that in the software space and this sharing of specialization. And so we are a little bit avant-garde in that space, part of a small cast of companies doing that. And I think that'll take off more and more, but that's actually pretty new. SaaS business models and like, that's all new in biotech. That'd be so interesting for multiple clients of Spring to be able to cross-pollinate you know, permissively and have Spring be able to let them know, hey, you might want to chat with so-and-so the Venn diagram of what you guys are working on is somehow intersecting and then make that introduction either programmatically or in person. Yeah. I mean, getting people to be open in that level would be a whole other thing. Sharing data, that's a whole nother bottleneck that would be hard, but great in this industry. But yeah, just the business model is actually tough. Uh, most people want to own drugs. Yeah. Well, they got to make up for the cost of every, you know, everything that was so upfront and yeah. Exactly. Yep. Well, there's amazing stuff happening at Spring Science with AI and machine learning, and you've been at the forefront, and I appreciate you, and I appreciate your friendship, and I appreciate you coming on the show today, Ben Kamen. Oh, no, thanks for having me, and thanks for all you do, and like I said, you've been a big personal impact on me and my own health, how I think about and deal with type 1 diabetes, so um, yeah, very appreciative of your friendship as well. 
Thanks so much. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.